Hi, this is Ron Martino. Today I'm gonna show you how to fix the broken cable on a MacBook Air MagSafe charger. It's a pretty old model, but people around the world still use those laptops a lot. And Apple charges about a hundred euro for a replacement. So this video is basically about how you can do it for free. Okay, here's the deal with this charger. Because it's manufactured by Apple, it has a pretty complex schematics. It's not your regular flyback step-down converter. It actually contains a microcontroller, both inside the MagSafe connector and the main case. Now, these chargers basically come in three versions, 14 volts, 16 volts, and 18 volts. So the purpose of the chip inside the connector is to allow the laptop to identify a charger model. Contrary to what one may think, it's not the voltage that actually matters. MacBook logic board can accept charging voltages ranging from around 13 to 19 volts without any problem. I have tested it personally. And it will adjust the current accordingly. The thing is, MagSafe chargers that have higher voltage also happen to have a higher power rating, which, as the physics formula suggests, translates to higher current. So, the chip inside the MagSafe connector actually tells the laptop how many amperes it's allowed to take from the charger. And it boils down to this. If you use a charging cord from a 45 watts charger with a 60 watts charger, your laptop will be underpowered. If you do the opposite, your charger will be overloaded. So, your rule number one should be, when doing MagSafe charger repairs, use the cord that came with your charger or the cord from the charger that has the same power rating. You may have come across third-party cords sold on eBay, Amazon or AliExpress. I have tried to contact sellers many times asking them about MagSafe chip power settings, but they failed to provide any reasonable answers. You can actually find out the power rating returned by the ID chip by going to Apple menu, About this Mac, System Report, Power, then scrolling down to AC Charger Information but you can only see it after the repair. It's quite interesting also that the ID chip does not interact with the charger in any way. It only communicates with the logic board of the laptop. And it's also the logic board that's responsible for changing the LED color on the connector. On the other hand, the primary purpose of the processor inside the charger is to make sure the power is removed from the MagSafe connector when it is not attached to the laptop. The first reason why it's important is the safety considerations. For example, if your cat accidentally licks the pins, he or she may get an electric shock. The other reason is to prevent contact sparking when circuit is opened or closed, which obviously extends the MagSafe connector lifetime. And because the charger is run by the processor, we have yet another issue to consider here. I have repaired a number of MagSafe adapters, and in some cases, unfortunately, as the cable insulation gets broken, and the wires twisted and obviously shorted, the microcontroller locks itself up, probably for safety purposes too. In this case, while the converter inside the charger is running, the MOSFETs responsible for switching the output are off, so there is no voltage at the output terminals. I have not tested this particular charger yet, but before we proceed to opening it, to save time, we have to make sure it's actually working. So. What I'm gonna do now is first, make sure the output is not shorted. Second, solder a couple of wires to what's left on the cable and measure output voltage with the help of a multimeter. The cable used here is called coaxial. It has a central wire and a concentric conducting shield separated with insulation. The purpose of the shield in coaxial cables is to reduce external radio interference. These types of cables are typically found in circuits carrying low-level AC signals, like old-school TV antennas, for example, or audio equipment. For some reason, however, they are also used in chargers, both laptop and mobile, which is sort of strange because charging is done with DC, which does not require shielding. If you know the real reason, please leave your comments below. Okay, our cable is broken at the very base, and I would really like to preserve the sleeve. So what I'm gonna do now is cut it just a little bit, so I can strip the wires without shorting them. That's better. The cable also contains a nylon thread, which serves the enforcement purposes. Gonna cut that one a little bit too. The central wire is too short to be stripped. 
I'm going to try to melt its insulation with a soldering iron, which, in fact, you should normally never do, as it creates fumes and damages insulation. But we'll make an exception. Let us make sure the output is not shorted, because if it is, the outcome may be opposite of repair. Looks okay. Let us supply power. So, we got 0.4 volts at the output. This is obviously not the voltage used to power or charge the laptop. It's just a potential used by the internal sensing circuit to detect the load. To force the charger into full working mode, we have to attach a 39 kilo ohms resistor across the terminals. And this will be the moment of truth. If we have no output voltage, it would mean the microcontroller is already locked up and we can dump this baby. But it looks like we're in luck today. So, our next objective is to open up this fella and solder the salvaged cable to the circuit board. What I would also like to achieve here is to fully preserve the looks of the casing so the charger appears undamaged and unopened. To pull that off, we have to follow the two simple rules. Rule number one, do not use any metal tool for opening. It's elementary actually, but most people don't realize it. Whenever you apply a harder material to a softer material, you are sure to leave traces on it. The charger case is made of plastic, which is softer than metal, so we are not allowed to use metal on it. Rule number two, try to make contact area as large as possible. That will reduce specific pressure. We have to pull these halves apart. Here's what they look like opened. I will use this improvised removal tool made of two metal pieces. Naturally, I will put some PVC duct tape around it. There. That's much better. Should not use too much of it either, otherwise it may become too elastic. And there we go. Repeat on the other side too. Good. Can you see any damage? I can't. Now, I suggest we do not torment the case anymore. We can already pull this part outside and work on it. So I'm gonna cut the wires as close to the sleeve as possible. Then I'm gonna modify the sleeve so I can pass the cable through it. Then I will simply solder the cable to the wires sticking from the charger reinstall the sleeve and snap the case halves together. But before we proceed, it's a good idea to recheck the polarity. I'm pretty sure the black one is negative, but it never hurts to check. You have to realize that powering your laptop with the wrong polarity will probably toast it instantly. So, as they say, look before you leap. Now we have to gently drill the sleeve to get rid of the debris of the old cable. We've gotten to the base of it, now it makes sense to drill from the opposite side in order not to damage the outside visible part of the sleeve. Okay, I've drilled through it. Now we have to make the hole a tad bigger. Looks great. Pull the wires out a little bit. You have to solder very carefully to make sure you do not melt the plastic. As you work on the wires with the soldering iron, make sure they hang over the table and not over the plastic casing. Do not forget to separate the nylon threads from the negative shield and cut them off, otherwise you won't have a nice solder joint. I will use a heat shrink tube here. You should solder quick, otherwise it's going to contract too soon. If you use a heat gun, set it to around 160 degrees Celsius. That will make sure the tube gets enough heat, whilst plastic is left undamaged. ABS plastic starts to melt at around 200 degrees Celsius, that's roughly 400 Fahrenheit. I will also use an adjustable clamp to fix the cable. Now, before we put the entire assembly inside and snap the case, it would be a good idea to test the charger, agree? But I'm gonna recheck the polarity first. We have 14.8 volts with the resistor, and 0.4 volts without it. Wait for the LED to turn orange now. Great. Let's finish up. I think I should not put too much glue there.
All's well that ends well. That's it for today, folks. Please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to like and comment and share. This was Ron Martino. See you next week.